Hello everyone and welcome to our YouTube channel Lit Savvy, a guide to English literature. In the previous video, I had covered the first 10 stanzas of Thomas Gray's Elegy written in a country churchyard and this video is a continuation series of the previous one. So now, let's begin. Can storied urn or animated bust back to its mansion call the fleeting breath? Can honor's voice provoke the silent dust or flattery soothe the dull cold ear of death? Here the poet is referring to the Egyptian pharaohs and those great kings who when died their precious items, jewels and other favorite objects were preserved in their graves or when statues were made for them to honor and commemorate them. Can all these things bring back to life the one who is dead? In other words, can life be thrown back into the body which no more breathes? One who is mingled with dust and is cold with death, can words of honor or praise bring it back to life or can flattery bring it back to its senses? Honor, flattery and death have been personified here. Perhaps in this neglected spot is laid some heart once pregnant with celestial fire, hands that the rod of empire might have swayed or waked to ecstasy the living liar. In these lines the poet says that in this neglected spot that is the graveyard lies someone who was a saint or a seer or who could have been a great ruler or a great musician. But knowledge to their eyes her ample page rich with the spoils of time did never unroll. Chill penury repressed their noble rage and froze the genial current of the soul. The poet continues by saying that these people were illiterate and could never gain access to big books of knowledge. They had to always fight poverty and all nobility and generosity. They could not practice because their energies were spent in fighting against poverty. Full many a gem of purest ray serene, the dark unfathomed cave of ocean bare, full many a flower is born to blush unseen and waste its sweetness on the desert air. Here the poet metaphorically compares the villagers who are dead now to the rarest of the gems that lie hidden in the deepest and darkest caves of the oceans that have not been explored by humankind and to those flowers who are the most beautiful of all with the sweetest of fragrance but they die without the world noticing their beauty. Some village Hampton that with dauntless breast the little tyrant of his fields withstood some mute inglorious Milton here may rest some Cromwell guiltless of his country's blood. Here the poet has given reference to some important political leaders and figures and compared the villagers to them, saying that amongst these villagers might have been a soul equally courageous, brave and fearless who would have opposed the tyranny of his master on the fields like those well-known political leaders of his time. Can storied urn or animated bust back to its mansion call the fleeting breath? Can honor's voice provoke the silent dust or flattery soothe the dull cold ear of death? Here the poet is referring to the Egyptian pharaohs and those great kings who when died their precious items, jewels and other favorite objects were preserved in their graves or when statues were made for them to honor and commemorate them. Their lot forbade nor circumscribed alone their growing virtues, but their crimes confined forbade to wade through slaughter to a throne and shut the gates of mercy on mankind. 
Here the poet says that they had a very limited fortune. Not only were their virtues confined, but their crimes and sins were also accordingly of very small magnitude, as they never had to kill anyone for the purpose of throne, and they never had to cruelly rain on people of their kingdom. The struggling pangs of conscious truth to hide, to quench the blushes of ingenuous shame, or heap the shrine of luxury and pride with incense kindled at the muse's flame. Here the poet says, they never had to bear the pain of struggle on hiding truths and their conscience never had to bear the pain of guilt. They never did such deeds that they had to be ashamed of it, nor did they spend their lives in accumulating comforts and luxuries and live a life filled with vanity. Far from the madding crowd's ignoble strife, their sober wishes never learned to stray. Along the cool sequestered vale of life, they kept the noiseless tenor of their way. Here the poet says that these people were far from the noise and humdrum and cutthroat competition of city life. Their dreams and desires were very ordinary. They lived their lives in a peaceful and separate world. Yet even these bones from insult to protect some frail memorial still erected nigh with uncouth rhymes and shapeless sculpture decked implores the passing tribute of a sigh. In these lines the poet says that unlike the graves of influential people, the graves of these people had some frail memorial erected over them with uncouth rhymes and decorated with some shapeless structures to protect it from insult and to request a tribute from passers-by. With this, we come to the end of the second part of Thomas Gray's Elegy written in a country churchyard. We'll continue with the rest of the poem in part 3. Till then, stay home and stay safe. Thank you.